Please welcome Dr. William Inboden, Executive Director of the William P. Clements Center for National Security at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, good, af good afternoon. It's my uh, honor to introduce our final panel here of the Vietnam War Symposium. Uh, this one is titled, Lessons Learned, The War's Effect on America's Foreign and Military Policy and Our Role on the World Stage. Now, the mission of the Clements Center is to apply the insights of history to current national security challenges. And so it's fitting that our final panel of this summit explore how the legacies of Vietnam continue to loom over our nation's foreign and defense policy today. To explore this question, we're going to hear from three leaders who are singularly equipped to address this question. Each of our panelists is a warrior who has experienced the searing, who has experienced the searing intensity of combat. Each is also a statesman who has shaped our nation's national security policy at the highest levels of government. They are Bob Carey, who served as a Navy SEAL in Vietnam, for which he received the Congressional Medal of Honor, our nation's highest military honor, for his uncommon valor in combat. He went on to become governor of his home state of Nebraska for one term before serving two terms in the U.S. Senate, where he was the vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. He was then president of the New School in New York City before becoming managing director of Allen & Company. Bill McRaven is currently our chancellor of the University of Texas system here and a retired Navy four-star admiral. Prior to becoming chancellor, he was the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, where he led a force of 69,000 men and women uh, and was responsible for conducting counterterrorism operations worldwide, including the operation that killed Osama bin Laden. He's ad advised Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama and many other U.S. leaders on defense and foreign policy issues and, and received many awards for his service. Chuck Robb is a Marine veteran of Vietnam and was awarded the Bronze Star for his service in combat. He later served as Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Governor of Virginia, and a United States Senator, where he was the only Senator to serve simultaneously on the Senate's three national security committees, Armed Services, Foreign Relations, and Intelligence. In 2006, he was appointed to serve on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, and he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And finally, our moderator will be Mark Lawrence. He's an associate professor of history here at UT, a distinguished scholar at the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and the director of graduate studies for the Clements Center. His books include Assuming the Burden, Europe and the American Commitment to War in Vietnam, and The Vietnam War, A Concise History. And he's really one of our nation's leading uh, scholars of the Vietnam War. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to this uh, climactic session of this fascinating <laughs> three days. Uh, our topic, of course, is lessons learned. A number of panels so far over the last three days, how could they not have, have, of course, touched on the lessons of the war. But here we have a chance to uh, isolate this issue uh, with three people who are, I think, particularly well qualified to speak about it. I am a historian of the Vietnam War, and I've become very interested in recent times in the uh, ways in which Americans have tried to come to terms with the legacies of the war and learn lessons from the war. But when I approach this subject, of course, I use official memos and reports and speeches and the kind of thing, frankly, that one can find on the 10th floor of this wonderful uh, repository. But here we have a chance really a bonanza for a historian like myself to sit down with people who have truly lived the American attempt to come to terms with the lessons and legacies of the Vietnam War. So this is personally a very exciting opportunity for me and I think a wonderful opportunity for all of us to bring this uh, event to a conclusion. I thought the place to begin is with our two Vietnam veterans and to pose to them the question, of what were your ideas as you set out for Vietnam back during the 1960s about the political and military challenges that US forces face there? And then how did your thinking change by the time you uh, departed Vietnam and came back to the United States? Shall we start with Bob? Well, first I apologize on the flight in here because I, I never know what I'm gonna say. Uh, <laughs> I uh, wrote an answer to your question and 
uh, annoyed my fellow passengers by practicing, and I hope I keep it relatively <laughs> short. So, uh, I, I'm not certain we learned any th lessons from the Vietnam War. And soon, uh, all of the participants, those who advocated for and organized it, those who fought in it, and those who protested or resisted participation, will all be dead. Uh, this conference, as well as Ken Burns' documentary, will become part of a large and still growing historical record. Very few of our elected leaders today, and fewer still going forward, will understand that history. And truth be told, American executive or legislative branch officials rarely provide historical context of any kind when answering foreign policy or national security questions. And that's because voters uh, equate weakness with explanation of subtle historical nuance. Voters in particular do not like to be told that their ideological conclusions are built upon the sands of ignorance. <laughs> so we... <laughs> well, thank you for plotting, but I did it myself for 16 years. So, uh, <clears throat> so we're treated uh, and become addicted to the satisfying pleasure of foreign policy and national security reduced to bumper stickers, applause lines, sound bites, and tweetable answers. Donald Trump gave us plenty of these yesterday in our nation's capital. In my case, I knew nothing about the history, the culture, or the economy of Indochina in 1969 during my brief time in country. And from my own amateur reading of history since, and listening particularly to wiser people than me, what I now see is the, 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 when I look at the Vietnam War, I do see it as a tragic event that happened at the end of a 500-year-old story. And uh, you can be rest assured I'm not going to tell that 500-year-old story <laughs> here this afternoon. But it includes the rise of international trade and the growth and the reluctant withdrawal of European empires, the in Industrial Revolution, the conflicts between labor and capital, and the evil corruption by Lenin and Stalin of a bad, uh, bad economic idea in the first place the First and Second World Wars, the peace agreements that followed, the 50-year conflict between the Soviet Union and the West, the terrible and too often forgotten proxy wars between the two sides, the betrayal of an ally we promised we would never abandon, the bloody awful tactics chosen by the United States to attempt to defeat North Vietnam and its insurgent force, the National Liberation Front, the arrival of one and a half million Vietnamese boat people who had become American citizens, and the rise of an independent Vietnam as an important leader in Southeast Asia. But understanding this history is less important to me than working to try to build peace between the United States and Vietnam, a project that began for me in the early 90s as the Soviet Union was collapsing and the Cold War was ending. My part of this work began actually in 1990 when Secretary of State Jim Baker approved the opening of a prosthetic clinic, clinic in Hanoi. And the man behind this idea was Ernie Burgess, a retired Veterans Administration surgeon who wanted to build better limbs for American veteran amputees like myself, and wanted to do the same for Vietnamese veterans. And when I visited the clinic, I spoke with a man who had fought with the Viet Minh against the French, and another who had fought with the North Vietnamese Army against the United States. And all three of us were walking on limbs made by Ernie Burgess. About the same time, under the leadership of the, of the first President Bush, Under Secretary of State Richard Solomon successfully led a very complicated and difficult effort to reach a peace agreement to end the fighting in Cambodia. And equally important was the POW MIA Commission, led by Senators John Kerry and John McCain, which concluded that there were no live Americans being held as prisoners by the Vietnamese government in at, at that particular point in time. These two efforts, allowed President Bush, the first President Bush, to negotiate with the government of Vietnam to produce a roadmap to, to normalization of relations between our two countries. And President Clinton completed that part of the project in the summer of 95 by signing legislation that ended the trading with the Enemy Act, commercial restrictions, authorized the opening of a U.S. embassy in Vietnam, sent a former POW back to Vietnam as our first ambassador in 20 years, and set the stage for a bilateral trade agreement. We went back to Vietnam at the site, in, in my view, of our worst foreign policy mistake with our heads held high, not with our heads hanging down. Uh, all, all these things were extremely controversial. The black POW MIA flag still flies over most state capitals, including here in Austin. 
as a sign that opponents of these actions, especially many Vietnam veterans, is alive and well in the land. Contained in that legislation was a provision that established a graduate school of education through the U.S. State Department's Fulbright program. It's located in Ho Chi Minh City. It's enabled more than 1,000 Vietnamese to finish uh, master's and graduate programs. And today, with bipartisan support in the Congress, we're working with the support of President Obama, uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, Senator McCain, and many other people, including the government of Vietnam and the Vietnamese community, we're building an undergraduate school. The university's first president is a woman who grew up in Hanoi. She remembers the war. She remembers the Christmas bombing. She remembers the terrible destruction. And yet, she does not hate us. She sees us as a partner and as friends, and we try our best to continue to deserve these titles. Making peace is hard. In some way, it's harder than making war. In part, this is true because our memories of war tend to harden as we age. For our personal happiness, we should resist this tendency. As important as it is to understand the history of Vietnam War in order to avoid the mistakes that caused so much suffering, we can still make good foreign policy and national security decisions if we are completely ignorant of that history. We only need to follow the hope of the great Irish poet Seamus Haney, who had plenty of experience of violence and the bitterness that flows from these traumas. Here's part of a very often quoted poem called The Cure at Troy. Human beings suffer, they torture one another, they get hurt and they get hard. No poem, play, or song can fully right a wrong, inflicted and endured. History says, don't hope, on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the long four tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. This is a lot easier said than done, but it is what we are trying to do today in Vietnam. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> well, we may still try to get you to talk about your experience in <laughs> okay, Vietnam, fine. but uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to you. <laughs> Thank you for that, though. Um, Chuck, would you? Well, first of all, I've known Bob for a long time. We have been co-conspirators on a variety of different projects, including the uh, normalization relations with, uh, with Vietnam. I came to the uh, to service in Vietnam uh, a little differently than many of our fellow veterans. Uh, I had wanted, uh, after a, a very uh, positive experience in uh, uh, Marine Officers Basic School at Quantico, uh, had wanted to get into some uh, opportunity to see if I was as good as they thought I was. And, but they kept giving me better assignments than I could ever ask for. My very first assignment uh, out of basic school was to be the executive officer of the Marine Detachment on USS Northampton. Uh, Bill may remember where, what the Northampton was. It was a highly classified National Emergency Command post afloat. We had President Kennedy at sea with us for two days with all the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the uh, uh, chairman and ranking members of the uh, relevant committees and what have you. The entire Atlantic fleet passed in review. I think it was 81 men of war, starting with wow. the carriers, the cruisers. Uh, it had never been done, certainly on that magnitude before, and never had been. But this is my first assignment. I never asked for anything like that. I go down to Camp Lejeune to report to the 2nd Marine Division. I end up being the senior aide, uh, the only aide to the commanding general, and spent three years traveling the various uh, places where, where we had responsibilities. Uh, and I thought, well, finally I'm going to get, because uh, Vietnam is now starting to come on the uh, radar screen, I get, I'm thinking, well, I, I know they're going to send me over there now. And they send me up to Marine Barracks, Washington, 8th and I, owned to the Marines, which is the uh, utmost in ceremonial posts. The Marine Van, the Marine Drum, the Yugo Corps, the Commandant, all of those activities are, are focused right there. And I had an additional duty as, uh, uh, as a White House military social aide. Uh, I was also in charge of the White House Color Guard. Uh, everything was going well, and I, I'd also continued to re-up my request to, uh, at this point, uh, no longer just uh, uh, Westpac duty, but I, I wanted to go to specifically to, to uh, Vietnam. Uh, I knew that, but then I, uh, by chance, ended up marrying the Commander-in-Chief's daughter. <laughs> uh, the good thing about that particular uh, happening was that I didn't have any more problem with getting to Vietnam. Uh, and when, when I got there, 
Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to, when I reported in and sent to the 1st Marine Division uh, to report to the Commanding General, and he was somebody I knew from previous service uh, and had actually played golf with uh, five years before whatever it had been. Uh, so I thought, this is a good sign. I'm not going to get stuck in the rear with the gear or whatever the case may be. And then I went down to, I was ordered to, to report to the uh, 7th Marine Regiment, and who should be there but the man who'd actually recruited me into the Marine Corps. And I thought, you know, things are going really well. I went down to the battalion. I got assigned to be the commanding officer of India Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, which for infantry officers in the Marine Corps is the ultimate uh, assignment. But it took me, uh, let's see, eight, nine years uh, in the Marine Corps. And a lot of people said, you, you, you could have gotten out. You didn't need to go to Vietnam. And uh, even, even some fairly serious people made that recommendation. I said, you don't understand. I, I need to go. Too many of my uh, brother uh, service people, Marines, uh, all, all services, have gone over, to, uh, a number of them haven't come back. And if I were to leave before I had actually uh, tested my medal in, in that particular circumstance, I could never live with myself. But it's a very different situation if you're drafted or if you're against the policy. And in, in all truth, uh, I was reasonably comfortable with the, the, the general policy at that particular time. And, and I had read about Dan Bien Phu and, and some other things, but had no first-hand experience. Bottom line is, I went as a, as a, an, uh, a very aggressive volunteer. Uh, I, I was nominally uh, supportive of, of the uh, domino theory, if you will. Uh, I believed Lee Kuan Yew when he said that, uh, but for that action, uh, the uh, Indochina, the ASEAN uh, nations might be very different today than they were. But in any event, I, I understood the circumstances. I'll, I'll wait till we get to other questions, but that's how, we, how I entered it. So I, I was uh, happy to be there, uh, in a sharp contrast with uh, many of my fellow vets, uh, but I, I, I was not dragged there. I got there on my own volition. And did your thinking about the challenges that the United States faced in Vietnam change dramatically as a result of your Not, uh, As a result of my particular participation, no. Uh, but as a result uh, over, over a period of time, we, we, were, uh, we were really fighting two wars. Uh, uh, the United States was fighting a war, a war against communism, uh, and, and not to exclude any uh, other uh, rationale, and the, the Viet, uh, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong uh, were fighting for uh, a battle of nationalism and to preserve uh, their country. And both General Gap and, and uh, Ho Chi Minh were quoted as saying they could absorb losses of 10 to 1, uh, and they could keep on doing that forever. And they were, they were never going to change. And so it, most of the changes that took place back here, and I was there in 98, 97, which when, when most of that the change was taking place, uh, that had more of an impact on the reversal. And, and once our, our fellow citizens uh, turned very much against the war and the uh, media, who had been very supportive, as had our fellow citizens, and, and Congress. And so you've got those three key elements that have to have your back. If, 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 you, if your citizens don't have your back, if, if, your, uh, if your Congress doesn't have your back, uh, you, you, you just have a, a very slim chance of, of succeeding. But if, if you're actually fighting different wars, uh, it, it's, it, it's hard to sort it all out. Bill, your military career began in 1977. Right. Two years after the fall of Saigon, four years after the, American, with the withdrawal of the final American troops from Vietnam. Can you talk about what the mood was like within the military at that very interesting moment in the history of the U.S. Armed Forces and how the lessons of Vietnam were being discussed in that, in that period. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. First, uh, let me begin by saying what an honor it is for me to be on the stage with these two great warriors and public servants. Um, I have followed both their careers uh, for most of my career, and, and gentlemen, thank, uh, you. thank you very much for everything you've done for us. Um, as you said, uh, I came in in 1977. I graduated uh, from ROTC here at the University of Texas and immediately went into basic SEAL training. Uh, 
and, uh, and all of my instructors were Vietnam veterans. And really for about the next 10 years or so in the military, the Vietnam generation continued to kind of train and mentor those of us that were new. And I can tell you from kind of a military standpoint, tactically, operationally, and strategically, everything that kind of shaped the way I grew up for the next, actually probably the next 20 years, was a result of Vietnam. I mean, going through basic SEAL training, as uh, Senator Kerry well knows, the, the tactical maneuvers, the shoot, move, and communicate, they were, they were drills we learned from Vietnam, how to patrol, uh, how to ambush, how to get out of an ambush, uh, how to communicate on a PRC-25, how to use the Brownwater fleet. I mean, all of these sort of things tactically was what drove us in the 70s and really to the mid-80s. Operationally, uh, it also had a huge impact because, again, even as SEALs, the lesson from Vietnam was you have to have artillery support, you have to have air support, you have to have what we refer to as combined arms. And, and not only my generation, but every successive generation understood the value of combined arms in a way that came out of Vietnam. And really strategically, I do think if you go back and look at that period of time from 75 until 9-11, um, you will see that the, the administration, certainly as you look at something like the invasion of Panama, even Grenada, but certainly Desert Shield and Desert Storm, the understanding that if we got in, we had to get out, and we didn't want to be mired down in a fight. I've got to believe that that was a valuable lesson that came out of Vietnam. Uh, and, and even when you look at the Powell Doctrine, I guarantee you the Powell Doctrine came as a result of General Powell's engagement in Vietnam. So while a lot of things may have gone wrong in the war, I think you can almost attribute that time from 75 until 9-11, the really extended period of peace with the exception of Desert Shield, Desert Storm and some of the smaller conflicts was a result of the lessons that we had learned from Vietnam. Bill, I appreciate your uh, uh, getting us to think about the, the long flow of time between 1975 and 9-11. I'd like to ask you gentlemen a couple of questions about specific points in that history uh, in the two or three decades after the end of the Vietnam War. It seems to me that the way the story conventionally gets told at least, in the immediate aftermath of the war, these were the years of the heavy Vietnam syndrome. In other words, Americans were principally learning the lesson that the United States needed to be very careful about using its force overseas or very tight constraints on what could be done politically. And we um, were getting a hollow army. Yes. Yeah. and, and problems as well with the sheer capability mm -hmm. to uh, exert power internationally. And then a really interesting moment in this story of American attempts to come to terms with the war comes in August of 1980 with the Ronald Reagan campaign. And if you'll forgive me, I'll just um, read you these famous lines. And I'd, my question to you, of course, is going to be for your uh, thoughts about how you not necessarily received these specific lines, but what you felt at the time about the sentiment that stood behind this suddenly resurgent idea that uh, uh, the United States should think differently about its experience in Vietnam and recover its ability to act boldly internationally. So Ronald Reagan famously, candidate Ronald Reagan, famously said in August 1980, it is time that we recognize that ours was in truth a noble cause. There is a lesson for all of us in Vietnam if we are forced to fight, we must have the means and the determination to prevail, or we will not have what it takes to secure the peace. And while we are at it, let us tell those who fought in the war that we will never again ask young men to fight and possibly die in a war our government is afraid to let them win. What was your sense of that sentiment um, at, around the time when these words were spoken? I didn't know. Notice it myself. I'm just doing other things. So, uh, uh, look, I, I mean, I was, I was just had been in business, and I was dealing with inflation at the time, so I, I wasn't paying much attention to what either uh, Ronald Reagan or Jimmy Carter were saying in 1980. Um, I don't think it's wrong. I, again, I think it's a lot easier to say it than to do it. Um, you know, I think we started this, this, with, with this effort with good intent. Um, you know, South Vietnam was a, was a, uh, a troubled, uh, uh, you know, a difficult democracy, but it was a democracy, and we valued freedom, and we took them as an ally. And, um, I, and, and there was an effort. I mean, 
uh, you know, uh, Stalin had died in 53, but the Soviet Union, the Chinese, were continuing to support insurgencies all over the, all over the world. And if you look at what they, but particularly what the, what the communists did in Eastern Europe after um, World War II, they basically would come in and comp compromise every liberal thinking social democratic party, and then they'd crush them uh, and take over the work. So it was, as I said in my statement, it was a terrible economic idea, communism, and made uh, into an evil force by the totalitarian nature of, of what we were experiencing. So it, it started, it was, I'm very uh, sympathetic with what the, what the president, what presidential candidate Ronald Reagan said, but, but it's a lot easier to, to say than it actually is to do. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not of the school that says if we just ramped up our effort in Vietnam, we could have won it. I'm just not of that school at all, because I think the thing, the most important thing that we underestimated was presuming that communism was monolithic and that, that, that basically Vietnam was a puppet of, of the Soviet Union and China. And they certainly had a lot of support coming from the Soviet Union and China, but they were more independent of the, of the Soviet Union and China than Yugoslavia was. And Yugoslavia was a well-known sort of renegade inside of the, uh, sort of the Communist Party movement. The uh, uh, suggestion, uh, you might characterize it, is uh, go big or stay home uh, is a little shorter version of uh, what Ronald Reagan said on that particular <laughs> occasion. And, and there is a lot of legitimacy, I believe, in that statement. But there's lots of qualifiers, too, which suggest that I mean, you don't, uh, if, if those elements that I mentioned earlier, if they don't have your back, uh, and if you don't have a clear understanding of, of the type of war uh, that you may be contemplating, uh, and, and some idea of what, it, what, what, what victory or success looks like and what kind of uh, circumstances would require you to rethink the whole uh, operation. Uh, and if you can't answer those and then uh, overlay that with the, the support of the international community, which I think is critical. I, I'd be happy to talk about uh, uh, Gulf War I in that regard. But uh, if, if, if all those pieces are not in place and if you don't have the capability and, and we've had enormous capability, uh, and, and many, I, I know there are a, a fair number of, of vets today that say, if we just gone all in, and not, they didn't have to be Curtis LeMay uh, and, and bombs away, but I mean, that, that we, we, we clearly had more capability, and, and, and we protected uh, the uh, Laotian and Cambodian uh, areas for, for critical supply, and, and some areas in, uh, uh, Vietnam were off limits, uh, and, and you, you can't really engage successfully against somebody that is prepared to stay there for the rest of their lives uh, with a strategy that is so limited. So you're, at some point, you're, you're, your luck is going to run out uh, under almost any circumstances. Yeah, I would just offer from a more practical sense, uh, again, three years into my time in the Navy, um, in, in 1980, when uh, candidate Reagan said that, uh, we already were on our road to a hollow force. And this, you see this after every major conflict, that there's an immediate drawdown. So as a Navy SEAL, even though we were relatively well resourced in terms of ammunition and weapons, we didn't have money to travel anywhere. So you, you had all the ammunition to shoot, but you didn't have a range to practice on. We had to go out to Nyland, California. It was about the only place we had as Senator Kerry knows, and that was it. So you weren't able to really refine your skills at all during that period. It really wasn't until the Reagan buildup when you began to see uh, resources applied towards the military that a number of things changed. I think, I mean, everything from the quality of our, of our capability to the integration to the you know, reduction of racial tensions, a lot of things that were, I would say, in some way were precipitated by the... the the, uh, the hollow force beginning to be developed after Vietnam. And once we began to strengthen our resources and take greater pride in the individual soldiers and sailors, airmen, and Marines, and, and the mission that we had, you began to see that turnaround. Um, so, uh, I mean, I do think you have to certainly credit uh, then President Reagan with that recognition that we had to have a quality military if we were going to be the leaders uh, of the free world. Let me ask you about the, the first Gulf War, another famous moment in the, in, in the history of American uh, 
attempts to come to terms with the legacies of the war. George H.W. Bush, in the immediate aftermath of that war, very famously said, by God, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. And it seems to me that not really, right? <laughs> the Vietnam syndrome hung over American decision making with respect to any number of uh, military operations thereafter. Why wasn't the first Gulf War more of a decisive turning point? Why doesn't it stand out as that moment when some of the conventional wisdom that seemed to surround the Vietnam War broke apart? Well, it wasn't entirely typical of most of the confrontations we're likely to run into today. You had a discrete uh, uh, nation that had been invaded, uh, the, the boundaries were much clearer, the, the aggression uh, on the part of the bad guys, if you will, was, was much clearer, the international community was behind you. Just a, a, a quick story to illustrate uh, in that particular instance, uh, a colleague of uh, Bob's and mine, uh, Warren Rudman and I were fortunate enough to be invited over to the White House by George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, to uh, discuss, it was about two or three days after the invasion had occurred, and one from each party, and then Brent Scrocroft and Bob Strauss, his, the Strauss Center is also uh, helping to sponsor this particular group, and he was a wise man who was well respected by both sides and, and would give some very clear advice. But we spent, I remember we, 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 risked, we ended up missing a Redskins Giants football game that day, <laughs> Uh, so it was a major contribution to go over there and, and spend the day. But, but he was interested in uh, getting some views, and, and really, he didn't say we want to talk about the Vietnam Syndrome, but it was very clear that that was on his mind, and, and we offered a good deal of uh, advice. Uh, you get what you pay for. Uh, and, and then when, when, when the second Gulf War came along, uh, well, first of all, let me see. I, I, I was an advocate early on because I'd been involved in the planning stage. I'd gone on a, a, a CODEL that uh, Majority Leader George Mitchell had led to the area with seven or eight other, happened to be Democrats. I was the only one who was a supporter. I came back and remained the only one as a supporter. And, and George said he'll give me a buy because I'm so, I, I've been speaking on television and whatever in support of the force authorization uh, if the president should ask for it. Uh, but then when the second... Uh, Gulf War came around. It was, a, it was a very different situation. And most of the people who were th at least thinking about running for president had voted, quote, wrong, including my friend Sam Nunn, who uh, always regretted his vote against force authorization at that time. They weren't against authorization, but they were against doing it uh, at that particular moment. And it was, it was clearly a, uh, an up or down situation, and, and, and they, they got it wrong. When, when the next vote came along, and I was out of the uh, uh, arena altogether, but I, I looked and everybody who had expressed any interest in running for president at that point was in support of that position. Now they've since pulled back a good deal from some of those positions, but, but you could see how important being, get it, getting it right and, and putting the, the Vietnam uh, syndrome behind was to them. Uh, and I, again, they're, they're not all still supporting it. <laughs> But it was, it was an interesting phenomenon to watch, and, and, and I, I think that that is behind us uh, to that extent. But it'll always be in, in our, our, our subconscious. Uh, Thank you. Well, well, my, let, let, let me make, make one, one other comment. No. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> That's Bob. Uh, because I had been outspoken, and I, uh, Virginia, which is a, uh, a, a conservative and very military uh, state and would normally be expected to be very supportive of force authorization, calls coming into my office, knowing of my position, were nine to one against my position from the people in, in Virginia. And I went out several times to, to relieve some of the interns who were taking the calls because it, it, it was, they were getting devastated. I mean, the, the, the kinds of marks that people would have. It wasn't until day three of that particular conflict when it was clear that it was gonna to come to a successful conclusion and that we, weren't not, we were not gonna have significant losses. And even then, it only turned to 50-50 in terms of the relationship. So the Vietnam syndrome was still very much at play in the minds of the public uh, but I, I think in the minds of most policymakers that uh, we're, we've taken the, the right lessons and, and moved ahead. Thank you. 
Well, I, mean, I, I think the world of uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush, so I'm, I'm not being critical when I say this, but Vietnam is not a syndrome. It's a, it's a, it's a fact. It happened. And it's unpleasant to look at what happened because oftentimes it tends to conflict with the mythology that we've developed around ourselves, and I share that mythology. It binds us together. It's not unimportant. But it, it's a story. It's a real story. It happened. Both good, brave, cowardly. It was a, it, it, it's a story that we need to face. And I think what, what, what General Powell did in the first Gulf War is to say, um, we're going to calculate what we think our force structure is, and we're going to multiply it by two. Uh, what happened in the Iraq War, I believe, I think fairly, is that uh, Rumsfeld calculated what was going to be necessary and divided by two uh, <laughs> in order to be able to demonstrate that he could do it with a small force. Now, I, I, I also have to uh, put full. I mean, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was a Republican until 1978, so this is, I'm not terribly sort of partisan on these issues, but in fairness. Uh, the ramp up in military effort began in 79 with the Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan. So Carter really did start it. Reagan unquestionably continued it. But one of the things that gets missed in, the, in, in trying to understand the story of the Vietnam War, either from the perspective of the Vietnamese or the perspective of, of America, and by the way, I think you have to do both. It's massively self-indulgent to think that the Vietnam War occurred inside the United States. It didn't. Uh, that's why we call it the Vietnam War. We don't call it the Nebraska War. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it, is that, that it was exceptionally difficult time. I remember, I mean, I watched when President Johnson announced that he wasn't going to run for re-election. He was going to try to negotiate an end. Five days later, Martin Luther King was killed. And every city, in Amer every large city in America, other than Indianapolis, erupted in flames. The White House, I think they could see the fire a couple of blocks away. I mean, and that's just an indication of what was going on in the country at the time. And there's no question. I mean, I, I, have, I have a memory of what it was like to, to be, say I was in the military. If you were trying to apply for a job, you'd leave it off your resume in the 1970s. Uh, so it was a, it, it was a, there was a whole bunch of things going on uh, at the time. Uh, and it wasn't just uh, the, the, the controversy of the war, the countercultural revolution, the civil rights movement. I mean, America was really coming apart uh, at the time. I think we've resettled, and I think it began in the late 70s, and it's continued all the way through the 80s, and it's good news. But uh, to repeat, Vietnam is not a disease. It's not a syndrome that we can treat with changing our policy. It is a long and painful story, in my view, of missed opportunities. But Let me offer again. Yeah. From the desert, again, Desert Shield, Desert Storm standpoint, because so now 14 years in my career, I can tell you we are incredibly well equipped, incredibly well qualified as we went forward uh, into the Gulf. Um, but I, I, would, I would echo a couple things Senator Rob said, which was, at least from the military st standpoint, we felt the nation was behind us. We felt we knew what our objectives were. Uh, the, uh, the issue is it, there was a little bit of good versus evil. Saddam had invaded Kuwait. That was wrong. We, so in the military, even, I mean, I was a Navy commander at the time, but I can tell you even the youngest petty officers and sergeants understood this was now going to be a little bit of the good war. We were doing the right thing uh, in the right context, and we were well equipped to do so. Um, but something did fundamentally change, and, and actually Secretary Kerry mentioned it last night uh, about the fact that it, it, there was this, um, we support the troops. I don't know where it started. Uh, I don't know who generated the, the actual bumper sticker that said we support the troops. But what you saw was this was a fundamental change. It was no longer about the policy in terms of the recognition of the troops. It was about the troops were required to go forward and do what the nation asked them to do. And irrespective of whether we support the policy or not, we are going to support the troops. And I can tell you, as a troop, we understood that and we appreciated that. And again. When we came back from Desert Storm, there were parades. There was a, a conclusion. And the first thing the Desert Storm um, veterans did was reach out to the Vietnam vets everywhere they could to say, join us in these parades, be part of this. This is your welcome home as well. Um, so I do think both um, from a, a military standpoint, resources, capability, it was a turning point. But I can tell you in the, in the military at the time, 
we viewed it as an opportunity to right, wrong, or indifferent, to right what we felt were the wrongs from Vietnam, and again, embrace our, our Vietnam veterans as part of this good news of the success of, uh, of Desert Storm. Look, I think it's right, I think, I think it's right. I mean, the story you're telling is how the military, military. learned, the, the military unquestionably learned the lesson, but Bill, answer this question. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that America is saying support the troops. Uh, I think it's enormously important. I think it's enormously important in part because so few Americans have sons and daughters that are so in the absolutely. military today. And I, I, and my, the cynical side of me says it's guilt that's causing them to do it because, I mean, I, I talk to people who still think that we don't have anybody in, in Afghanistan uh, or Iraq. Sir. Uh, so how much of this comes from the all-volunteer force? Well, how it, much I, did yeah. that change things? Do you yeah, think? It has changed things. Again, the, the discussion Sorry, yesterday... Sorry, did I take over your job? Please, no, no. <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, Ken Burns used the term last night. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something about false patriotism. Yes. And it was to your point, uh, Senator, about uh, are Americans patriotic because there is this sense of guilt because now we have this warrior class. Because w what has developed from the all-volunteer military is you really do have a warrior class. We are finding ourselves more and more disconnected from the population. And therefore, the point made last night was then it's easier and easier for the administration to move you forward. I, I will tell you, having been part of that warrior class for a long time, uh, I was okay with that. Now, that may not be right, but I volunteered and said, I'm ready to serve the military. And I was okay with people continuing to worry about the Super Bowl or worry about uh, you know, what was going I was okay with that. I do think we, we can be on a slippery slope here of getting so disconnected that it is easy to send in the Marines, send in the SEALs, and not think a lot about it because the lack of connection back with the, the broader society. So I do agree it is something we, we need to be very, very cognizant of. Yeah, no, I'm, I've been very much concerned for the last 30 years or so about the parallel tracks that the country is proceeding on. There, there is a, essentially a military and military families track, and most of the uh, new uh, incoming recruits uh, come from somebody who families. already has a military background, and, and there is very little understanding. That's one of the reasons that I've also been uh, pushing, and Sam Nunn and I uh, co-sponsored some legislation very early on to try to provide some uh, sort of compulsory national service for a period, and it's two or three of the speakers uh, have said essentially the same thing here. Uh, cost alone, I think, prohibited us from getting as far as we'd like to have on that. Not, not requiring 100% uh, of the people to be in the military by any means. Maybe only 2% actually will choose the military, and maybe we'll give them a little extra incentive uh, for choosing the military. But everyone ought to, ought to make some contribution to what they've inherited and feel the, the binding that does take place in, in the military uh, in a way that it doesn't uh, take place in most other institutions in society. I agree with you. We've already moved in our conversation into the, well into the 21st century, but let me focus our attention for just a moment on the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. Um, I often say in the spirit of a horrible kind of black humor that these were great events for people like me because suddenly my knowledge of the Vietnam War was relevant again. <laughs> people were talking about Vietnam all the time, it seemed, especially after about 2004. Um, talking heads on TV, op-eds, it was all over the place, it seems to me. And uh, those of us who specialize in the history of the Vietnam War, in many cases, uh, wrote books uh, on this subject or at least articles. Was the Vietnam precedent, was the Vietnam analogy useful? Was it more useful or more of a detriment to the kind of debate that did and should have perhaps taken place around those two experiences? Was, was it useful to, to, to talk about Vietnam so much in connection with these new wars? Secretary Kerry last night said there's a danger sometimes of being prisoner of the Vietnam analogy. Did we, did we fall into that in recent times? I'll just offer my, my experience in Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan, I think very much mirrored the experience of these two gentlemen in terms of you're fighting an insurgency, uh, which means that they are living with people. In, in Iraq, of course, it's a much more uh, you know, modern society. Uh, 
But in Afghanistan, we went back and, of course, looked at the counterinsurgency doctrine from Vietnam. And, and the counterinsurgency doctrine, as hard as it may have been to actually implement in Vietnam, I think was a solid doctrine in terms of you have to gain the respect of the village elders, you have to make sure you have security zones, you have to link the, the areas of security one by one. It is painful, it is hard. But I would tell you, the, the other piece of this was, uh, and I was talking to a, a, a wonderful uh, army nurse here right before walking in, and, and I can tell you what she experienced as an army nurse in terms of the blast effects. So the kids coming off the battlefield in Afghanistan and Iraq probably looked very much like you know, the young men and women that were coming off the battlefield in Vietnam in terms of the amputees, in terms of how they were engaged, improvised explosive devices, ambushes, uh, RPGs, these same sort of, of, uh, of problems that beset us in, uh, again in Vietnam were there in, in spades and certainly in Afghanistan and, and uh, maybe a little bit to a lesser degree in, in Iraq. Um, but yes, uh, I will, it, it absolutely framed our thinking in terms of how we had to engage um, with the civilian population and, and engage the enemy. In a constructive way. In a very constructive mm -hmm. way, you bet. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, every time, because I, 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 probably the most important lesson I got out of Vietnam was nine months spent, nine months in a Philadelphia Naval Hospital, and I've continued to work uh, um, more on a volunteer basis today with, with veterans who've been injured. And uh, what Bill's saying is 100% right. It, it's, I mean, God, these multiple tours. I mean, we've, been, we've been at war in Afghanistan for 15, 15 years. years. No. Uh, and as I said, I mean, you pull 100 Americans at random, they'll, 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 and you ask them, are we in Afghanistan? And I don't think so. Where's that? Uh, and I mean, the trauma of those multiple tours uh, is uh, it's very, very difficult to measure. And the other thing I'd say about Afghanistan, which is brand new, is the, is the outsourcing. It was done to private companies, my God. Uh, uh, and, and Iraq as well. I mean, I think we lost, we, we lost $6 billion cash that went over there on pallets or something like that. I mean, it's the money that's been going out to, the, to private sector companies, I think it's just, it's, it's morally reprehensible against, particularly when you put it up against... When you put it up against the suffering of these, these men and women who have done it, both the physical and the psychological suffering. I mean, look at the suicide rates, even in SEAL Team. I never thought we'd have suicides in SEAL Team. Uh, and that's born, I think, of this, this long-standing anxiety and frustration. Then you come home and you expect everybody else to be changing. They're not. It's, it's these transitions back and forth from you know, active duty to civilian time is very, are very, very difficult. So. I think if you get pulled down underneath and look at what the, the Afghan and the, and the Iraq war has done, there, there's nothing comparable to Vietnam. Uh, I think it's, it's, in my view, it's far worse. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, I think that that issue, we're all in basic agreement. Sure. Okay. We're in violent agreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me shift gears for a moment. It seems to me that one of the lessons that the US government took away from Vietnam, it has to do with the need to manage information, particularly information about military campaigns. Um, I was reminded by a session with Dan Rather earlier today, how much freedom, flexibility reporters had on the ground in Vietnam, um, how much free discussion there was of operational tactical issues even. Um, and that seems to have changed pretty dramatically following the Vietnam War as a consequence of a conscious decision within the Defense Department or perhaps elsewhere, but especially there, uh, to manage information about military activities much more carefully. And I think a, you know, one can reasonably argue that this has been uh, a, a harmful thing to the need to have an educated citizenry with an awareness of what happens in battle zones. Could you, could you talk about that? Let me just... Uh, set the stage perhaps for a discussion because uh, most of us grew up in the period where you'd go to the Saturday matinee and see movie tone news uh, of the Second World War and it was absolutely without any real casualties uh, that were ever shown. Uh, it, was, uh, it was propaganda. Uh, it, was, it was good news but they, it was only good news and, and even the bad news was 
described in fairly favorable terms and it seemed to be uh, overtaken. But I'll also say that I don't think there's any uh, president, any uh, military commander, anybody else who isn't going to want to have some ability to have control over the message. Uh, if and, and that's going to be even more difficult, is right now, with everybody having their own little mobile devices. Uh, the, the chances of anyone covering up anything that was terribly significant goes way down. Uh, and in fact, reporters probably have a tough time keeping ahead of the uh, of the uh, uh, tweets or, or messages that are sent back home. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a natural instinct that we have to understand, at least, that having uh, somebody come into every planning session and then immediately critiquing it uh, as it goes along, or whatever the case, is not what a military commander wants to have. Uh, and and I, I think we do benefit enormously uh, by virtue of the, the volunteer uh, service now, so that you, you have more people who want to be there and not people who are there against their their will and whatever. And I can imagine the kind of uh, messages that we, going, we would be going back and forth from uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Syria, you name it, uh, today, uh, if, if, if that kind of capability existed uh, back in the Vietnam period. What can I say? That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he never used to say that. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> uh, well, let me, let me um, come in with a question that I think is best uh, directed to Bill, although I'd certainly welcome others who may wish to comment. W what is the state of play these days with regard to the place of the Vietnam War in military education? Uh, to what extent is the, the Vietnam War being taught um, to our young uh, military professionals? Yeah, I will tell you, you still find at all of the, the basic training areas, the, the war colleges, the Vietnam War is still very, very important to us in terms of, again, from a military standpoint, in terms of, as I said, both the tactics of it, uh, the operational aspect of it, and, and again, at the senior level, uh, again, the war colleges, the, the strategic implications of the Vietnam War. Uh, and, and we, again, and I think what you'll find is when Ken Burns' documentary comes out, uh, it will be kind of required, you know, watching for, you know, officers going through these, uh, these courses. And ought to be. And ought to be. Yeah, absolutely right. So, uh, w you know, I mean, I, I think the good thing about the military is we all kind of fancy ourselves as, as kind of many historians. You want to understand what happened in the Civil War, and you want to understand what happened in World War II, and you want to understand what happened in Korea and Vietnam, because your life depends on it. Uh, and you, you want to make sure that if there is an opportunity to learn something from what occurred before, that you take that opportunity and, and put it into play. Um, now, again, as each war gets further and further away, and you have less an opportunity to talk to people that have been there, much as Ken Burns said last night, it, it may not resonate quite as much because now you're referring to books or movies. Um, but, but it still resonates uh, very strongly within the U.S. military. It's interesting to me that you've just suggested that Vietnam is used to great constructive purpose within military education. Uh, Bob's first comment, I think, of the afternoon was that essentially we haven't learned lessons. Well, from, I'm referring to the civilian population. I mean, what right, Bill's talking right. about is inside exactly. the military. You know, so so, so it's, a, it's a, it's, it's, right. as he said, his life depends on it. Right. So, so a very, very important distinction, but I can't, I can't resist asking, given this contrast, how well do we do as a society in learning from history? I don't think we do very well at all. Um, you know, there's two things about history. Um, uh, first is it's work. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I just uh, I should have read it earlier. I just finished reading the memoirs of, uh, of Sherman's memoirs. Yeah. And I, I suppose if I was a career uh, Navy, Army, Marine officer, I probably would have read it much earlier. You would earlier. have read it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Because um, he gives real tactical, uh, as well as some interesting political things going on. But it, it's, the, the, the hardest thing is what I was saying about earlier when I was saying Vietnam's on a syndrome. History can, can, can cause us to look in the mirror and say, God, did we do that? And, uh, you know, I, my own view about war is that the citizens tend to get all excited at the beginning, get all pumped up, and then all of a sudden, oh, my God, people are dying and killing each other. That, that's, not, that's not good. And then the support drops off. 
Um, particularly in the all-volunteer force, where fewer and fewer people are actually having to, uh, you know, do the work. Every time I hear somebody say, we ought to go to, I mean, I hear Ted Cruz, we ought to bomb them, you know. Ted, you're not going <laughs> to bomb them. Uh, you know, you're not going to do any fighting. Uh, you're too damn old. Uh, you, you might not have been any good when you were young. I don't know. Uh, so, and, it, and, and some of it is some of it is a little bit connected what 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 Chuck was saying because we, we still tend to I see over dramatize and, and and clean it up. It's not all bad to do that, um, but as citizens, I, I just I I think studying history is really hard. I think by the way the history the the, the the, the historians have enabled us to understand lots of things that we didn't uh, know before, which can be painful as well. But it's it's the difficulty when you say, "Oh God, did we? You know, is that who we were?" And the, the hardest thing is to say, uh, "We're going to go on." I mean, that's why I emphasize the 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 the, the proudest thing that I did in the United States Senate was uh, participating in the peace agreement in Cambodia and helping to normalize. Chuck, I can remember that that was at least as controversial oh, as, sure. as as and. And it's working. We've gone back to Vietnam. We're developing a partnership. We're working well together. We're making peace. Uh, and I, I repeat it, peace is hard. Because, you know, it's, you, you gotta make decisions that, that uh, in, in, in group decisions, you never get, you never get perfection in, the, in those moments. And you're always gonna find some windbag on the sidelines who are gonna be <laughs> criticizing you. <laughs> I think you said that perfectly. I think there's anything I can, I can add to it. <laughs> Who would dare speak after that? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we are running short on time, um, but let me wrap things up with uh, a very straightforward and, and quick question. Is there a lesson of the Vietnam War that we haven't dwelled on here or perhaps other sessions have not hit upon that you would like to put on the table uh, of huge consequence or potentially of minute consequence? One very quick one is instead of having individual rotation, we have unit rotation. And I have long thought that individual rotation uh, was counterproductive. And if you can get unit rotations, people come in ready to, to work and, and, and carry out their mission together. If you have, uh, you're constantly got a couple of brand new people that you're trying to familiarize with the whole situation, and a couple of people that are short timers that are really counting down the days until they can get their flight home or whatever the case, uh, it, it undermines uh, morale uh, and makes it more difficult for the commander. Uh, so I'm, if there's any big lesson learned between Vietnam and, and the more recent uh, experience, I would say it's uh, unit rotation, yep. not individual rotation. Which is exactly, again, to the to Senator Rao's point, we learned that lesson from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It is, again, it's hard to do that, but it is a lesson. The, the Army did have these issues in Vietnam with individual rotations, and I know, again, when, uh, when Iraq started, that was one of the very first decisions going back to this because of that problem. I guess I would offer that uh, it's something that was raised last night, and again, both gentlemen here have talked about today, is the complexity of any war. And, uh, and you have to be careful about taking the wrong lessons away from the war. And sometimes we allow historians who may or may not have served in that war to interpret what they find in the archives and then draw those lessons, and then those lessons become the lessons of our history. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what happens sometimes. And, uh, but, I mean, you need to have somebody that does that. I don't, I don't want to dismiss that. But these things are very, very complex. Uh, there's nothing easy about them. That's why I think something like the, the Vietnam uh, War Summit here is so important, to have the opportunity to hear both sides of the story, uh, to hear of all the complexities, the, the good and the bad, and, and then kind of we need to collectively or, or individually make our own judgments about uh, what was right and what was wrong. Look, I, I, I think here history is a very good guide. And I speak to, on behalf and two civilians, uh, the, 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 I think of two great examples of, of, of uh, neither of them were connected to the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, the first is Gandhi, who insisted we're going to have a multi-religious nation. Uh, we're going to make peace, in his case, he's Hindu, we're going to make peace with the Muslims, and he died because of it. And the more eloquent one was Itzhak Rabin, who said any fool can make peace with a friend. It's making peace with an enemy that's hard. He did, 
He, he was at war with Yasser Arafat, and he died because of it. Uh, making peace is hard because you get criticized. People say you're weak. Uh, in my own view, real men do diplomacy as well. <laughs> Well, I think one thing that has become clear over the last three days is that the Vietnam War entails an infinite number of questions and an infinite and unending amount of controversy. The best that we can hope for, I think, at the end of the day is to have the debate at a higher level of sophistication and a higher level of knowledge. And I think these three gentlemen have helped us to think about some of these very weighty matters on a higher plane. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.